Okay, hi Gerard, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It's a pleasure, Grayson. Excellent. Um, how's the conference been going so far? It's been far? fantastic. It's just wonderful. There's something about Byron Bay that produces better thinking, I think. <laughs> so yeah, that's been fantastic. Yeah, really Excellent. Good. And um, you're, you're talking this afternoon about um, mobile technologies in some capacity, I think? Yeah, I am. And also broadly about, um, I suppose, technology in general. But yeah, particularly mobile technologies and the internet technologies. I mean, increasingly, I suppose, I see those as connected. If you think of something like you know, the iPhone now, which even though it's expensive, many people have, or, or the Android phones or a range of other devices, iPads, you've got uh, these personal media portable media that people carry around and these are ways that they're accessing the internet as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about that and in some ways what's the relationship between uh, the university, between teaching and research and technology and I suppose it's particularly sort of trying to think about the important role that the university in studying technology and researching it um, really plays in giving critical perspectives on technology and that that's pretty important because technology is so much a part of our everyday lives and culture. Yeah. Sure. So, what's um, I, I know that you write a lot about mobility and mobile technologies. Sure. What kind of um, takes? What what what's your take on on mobility and and the kinds of methodological or other critical inquiries that you bring to this you know this vast phenomenon? <laughs> As it is, because now we're looking at uh, five point five billion uh, mobile phone subscriptions in the world, heading towards you know six point five billion people, so soon more people in the world, um, you know, there'll be more mobiles than people in the world. So I suppose broadly my perspective is cultural, um, that I'm really trying to look at the ways that um, the technology has come to now with particular cultures of its own. So through the 80s and then the 90s, I think something developed that you could call mobile phone culture. And you see it in whether it's the way that people use mobiles in public spaces or private spaces, the way they uh, hold them up or gesture to them, but also things like text messaging, which is, I think, a really distinct, distinctly kind of mobile culture, um, and camera phones, actually, from, say, 2001 onwards. So I'm kind of interested in this sort of these little cultures of, of mobiles, and then I'm interested in how they um, connect to the big cultures, so the sense in which um, they're part of media now, actually a central part of media that um, really um, bring our culture to us, so very much are, are embedded in our, our way of life, the kind of classic um, Raymond Williams, the British cultural studies Marxist theorist scholar, talked about a more anthropological definition of culture, and I think that's pretty obvious for a lot of people, um, in a vernacular way about mobiles, that of course they're part of our culture, but I think we to think through that, how does that work, that there's been a bit of a resistance to mobiles seeing them as well, you know, text messaging means you can't write sentences anymore or uh, sexting, sending nude images of yourself via phones uh, is something terrible that's happening to young people or um, young people are, particularly a lot of it's about young people, are, are very absorbed in their mobiles and that's cutting them off from broader interaction with their communities, with their publics. They sort of are uh, telecocooning is a phrase that's used. They're in this sort of little cocoon that people are enveloped by these data clouds of devices that they carry with them wherever they go. And this, this kind of just keeps them within a closed circle of friends rather than opening them up. And of course, one of, one of the things I suppose I'm interested in is that actually these technologies are very much part of culture, they're very much part of public life. And it's pretty obvious when um, you're looking at mobiles as media, which is what my recent book is about. And you know, you think about the newspaper, we take it for granted, the newspaper entertains you, it brings you information, advertising, um, but it also enables you as a citizen to participate in various ways in public life. Well, mobiles increasingly do that. They actually carry the news now, because we know lots of people get the news from mobiles. Um, but, and through new social media like Twitter that come across mobiles. And do you think there's also a kind of, let's say, ontological aspect to mobile technologies? I'm thinking about, you know, McLuhan and the extensions of man yeah. and, and this, this imbrication of technologies. Is there yeah. something about mobile technologies that that have a kind of ontological effect? Does it change subjectivity? Are, yeah. are we in some way different as these mobile um, embedded Device. cyborg people. Prostheses kind of in a stellar the kind of like artist's form that 
Uh, I look, they're not so much the traditions I work in, I suppose. Marshall McLuhan or even, I don't know, say Heidegger, you know, the famous uh, German philosopher who, who wrote his powerful essay on technology. Uh, I suppose I'm slightly sceptical about that. I mean, I think, yes, they do certainly, uh, they're involved probably in, in changes in modern subjectivity at some level. I think they certainly are, are technologies that change, that work in particular relationships to the body. I mean, it's pretty obvious because, like, you know, you or I might be carrying a mobile around with us. Um, that now or in the future we might have other um, computers embedded on our bodies for medical reasons or, you know, all sorts of reasons. Um, so you've got a different relationship to the body. Um, but I, I, my work probably more focuses on, on the sort of ways that that's involved in the, the sort of reworking of what we think is society. And I am, I am slightly sceptical, you know, that sort of with mobile technology comes a different ontology because, I mean, it seems in part of the things is, is actually what you were initially saying about mobility is that there are different sorts of mobilities. One of the biggest sorts of mobilities in our society is the fact that many, hundreds of millions of people around the world migrate. You know, there's a sort of kind of mobility. Um, there are mobili other mobility technologies like cars, for instance. Then there's a relationship between being fixed and being mobile. So I think you've got to think about mobile technologies not only in a broader setting of kind of media ecologies, but also in a broader sort of social kind of setting, and to look at the different things at play. So yeah, I mean, so that's my kind of approach to it. Yeah, yeah nice. I, I like this idea of the kind of the circulatory flows that mobiles and mobility yeah. form part of, and that, that we're, we are already part of, obviously, and mobility yeah. or mobile technologies feed into that. Um, I'm thinking also, in do, do you take a cultural studies perspective on this, or what kind of disciplinary background do you take do do you have on this kind of work? Well, look, principally, probably media uh, media studies perspective. So, looking at the mobile as an, as kind of media, and looking at trying to identify in some ways the specificity of the medium. Um, then, I suppose the other main approach is cultural studies, in the sense that I do think it's important to understand you know, where mobile media is located in culture, how it works in culture. Um, I suppose the other perspectives are perspectives from um, social studies of science and technology, um, particularly the work of people like Judy Wiseman, who the feminist theorist of technology, but a whole bunch of other people, probably more down the um, seeing the world as fluid end of things is Bruno Latour, the actor network theorist. But it seems to me um, a lot of people perhaps segment off Bruno Latour's work and see that as quite different from the people who did classic works on the social construction of technology or the social shaping of technology or even history and philosophy of science, which has got a respectable discipline within sciences. I sort of see more of a continuum. So, yeah, I'm sort of interested then in looking at a critical technology perspective as well, and so combining media studies, cultural studies, technology studies, probably the other area um, is policy studies, because a lot of my work is also, because I used to work in policy in the 90s in telecommunications, which is kind of how I got into the technology game. Uh, it's a bit of a reflex to get involved and to think things through from a policy perspective. And I actually do policy work and write submissions and lobby and work with organisations around that. Is that one of the, the kind of potentialities of um, your way of working, that not merely can you speak to a kind of academic audience, but you can also situate yourself in relation to government and policy makers. How important is that? And I guess, is that, is that one of the important things about universities and the kinds of inquiries that we can conduct in universities? I think it is, yeah. I mean, I, probably I've made particular choices, and for me, I was sort of in policy while I was doing a PhD in English literature, and then came out the other end as kind of some recompose myself as a media and cultural studies academic um, so you know for me it seems a contribution I can make is actually to to look at the ways in which my research can inform policy or you know to be sort of added to public debate um, and I think there is a critical role for universities when you think of the in potential independence we have that there is a sense in which we can actually write about things um, to analyze things to do research on things um, where the, the politics of doing that is different from other people if you're doing commissioned research for, say, a large media corporation. So there's been a traditional role, I think, in particularly media studies, of media studies academics um, probably trying to treasure their independent role to contribute into policy. 
There's been a new emphasis over the last 10 years, particularly in cultural studies on engagement, not seeing the intellectual as just sort of independent and in the ivory tower and sort of being able to, to give damning judgments, but to actually be there sort of in the messy business of policy. So I probably alternate between those two things. But, you know, one of the things you notice in policy is that, um, you know, there's just not a lot of research. That there used to be a government agency in communications um, in the late 80s and 90s that did commission research. It was the Bureau of Transport and Communications Economics. Mm. It came from a kind of, you know, what we might think is a narrow economic perspective. They did do research. You know, that, that does not exist now. Government kind of contracts bits of research. So you look at the policy process in general and think, no, there's not a lot of independent research into media. And I think that's something for those of us who are interested and, in you know, that's simply one of the useful things we can actually contribute. And I think it's valued by a lot of people in the industry. Um, and that can lead to really interesting dialogues. And I think to be, you know, just make for better policy and better outcomes uh, for people generally in the area of media and communications. Absolutely. Um, and finally, um your thoughts on cultural studies. What is it? Why do we do it? Should we keep doing it in the future? <laughs> what do you reckon? Having been steeped in it for the last, whatever, two yeah. and a half days, yeah. um, cultural studies, what do you reckon? Get into it. No, um, I think it's really important, actually. I mean, you know, cultural studies styles itself as an anti-discipline quite often. Uh, you know, there's various kind of tendencies you might identify. For me, it's about, it's actually, to take it literally, it's about the study of culture. Uh, it's probably a little um, bit uh, glib in one sense to say that, but I think that is a powerful reminder. That for me, that keeps me anchored to say, well, what are we studying? We're studying culture. Actually, of course, in that, as we know, cultural studies makes particular methodological um, choices. It comes from particular stances about how it studies culture, often about studying power, often about trying to understand you know, popular culture as well as high culture or middle brow culture. But it seems to me, you know, it's about culture. It's really important. And what I find is if, if I'm just in doing media policy and media studies, there's something missing. And I think it is about that sense, you know, that people, culture matters for people. It's about their belonging. It's about their, their lives. It's about their ideas, their symbols, what their practices. Uh, that's what cultural studies is good at doing in a kind of holistic way, but also I think in a very precise and subtle way. Yeah, so I think it's got a, a bright future. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Gerard. Great, Cheers. Pleasure.